And we listen to all our music on the most wonderful device ever created, the Zoon. 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 Treasures? Gifts? You got it all wrong. That stuff is just their own wonderful stuff. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 things from the 2000s that don't exist anymore. How long was I out? Is Napster still a thing? For this list, we'll be looking at various objects, technologies, and basic concepts from the 2000s that have become obsolete. What items do you fondly look back on? Let us know in the comments. Number 10. Nintendo PictoChat Before the iPhone, there was the Nintendo PictoChat. This 2004 messaging app was included on various Nintendo DS consoles. Essentially, one user could type or draw on their console and share their message to other DS users. Hey, look what I got! We can chat on these! Those who played Super Smash Bros. Brawl may recognize the Picto Chat, as it actually appears as a stage in the game. The app is technically still alive, but let's be honest, does anyone actually use it anymore? I'm still cool. Nah, you've changed, man. The DS was discontinued in 2013, and the 3DS has since replaced PictoChat with another app titled SwapNote. Number 9. LiveJournal This social networking service technically started back in 1999 when a programmer named Brad Fitzpatrick created it to stay in touch with his friends. Nothing is more important than having the freedom to express your thoughts and feelings openly with others. On today's social networks, however, you probably feel pressure to censor many of your true feelings and opinions. The basics. People write a personal journal and other users can read it. It was eventually adopted by various fandoms and used for things like fan fiction and original stories. But even this was eventually taken elsewhere. I was so calm and boring, I didn't even want a live journal. And then Dawson's Creek got bad because there was no one to speak truth to power. Dawson's Creek did not get bad. Nowadays, the service is mainly used in Russia. Uh, Can I get go. Uh, ah, Russia. Yep, the product was eventually sold to Russian company SUP Media, where it became a popular site for political pundits and public figures. Claimed $30 million was paid for the global brand, but Soup suggested to Business Today the figure was much higher. So, like the Twitter of Russia? Number 8. Pagers Shockingly enough, some people have never seen a pager outside of a movie. Can I ask you a question? Do you know if the hotel's pager-friendly? What do you mean? I'm not getting a sig on my beeper. Pagers were essentially used to transmit voice and text messages before the invention of cell phones. Gosh, I hope you got a picture of that with a camera on your beeper. Actually, my beeper doesn't have a camera, but it does have a pedometer. Actually, not this one. These things have been used since the 50s, although they lasted well into the 2000s. First of all, Jake, there's no records that you and I teamed up together because you insisted that we only communicate through a beeper. <laughs> Stupid beepers were right to be addicted to our phones. In 2003 alone, the pager industry generated over $6 billion in revenue. Unfortunately, this all came crashing down upon the widespread adoption of cell phones and, you know, texting? Oh, my moolah! It's escaping my clutches! Nowadays, pagers are mainly used in public health and emergency industries. Uh, what's with the second beeper? Carla gave it to me. This is due to their systems being more reliable than cell networks. Number 7. Microsoft Zune The Zune was essentially Microsoft's answer to the iPod. It was a line of portable media devices that could play music and videos through the Zune Music Pass service. Now just show me how to work this thing. Well, the turning thing there makes the songs go up and down. Made by primitive people. That is primitive. Sure, some of my favorites. It's got traffic. That's really good. The first model, the Zune 30, came equipped with a whopping 30 gigs of storage and a 3-inch screen. It was introduced in 2006, but sales were immediately stagnant. It took just 3% of the MP3 market and was considered dead by 2008. I stood in front of a case of iPods and I bought a Zune. <laughs> What's a Zune? Yep, exactly. Sales had crashed and even major stores like GameStop refused to sell them, citing a lack of demand. I am never gonna financially recover from this. The hardware hung on until 2011, until it was mercifully discontinued. Number 6. CD Binders 
CD players were introduced in 1982 and quickly eclipsed records as the primary method of listening to music. Well, lads, what do you think of the new album cover? Great, but it won't look good when it's shrunk down for a CD. CD? What's a CD? A digital compact disc? Their popularity lasted well into the 2000s. That is, before things like the iPod and smartphones essentially made them obsolete. I get iPod. He only get iPod mini. But before then, we needed something to hold our hundreds of CDs. The answer? CD binders. These were large books filled with plastic pages, and in these pages were slots in which to slide a CD. Unfortunately, the fun of flipping through these booklets went out with CD players themselves. Son of a bitch. Now we can scroll through our phones instead. Admittedly, it does not bring the same joy. Number 5. Sony Ericsson Remember the Sony Ericsson? Not many do. Pepperidge Farm remembers. The mobile market is a fickle thing, and many companies, including BlackBerry, have come and gone. Smartphones were actually in play long before the iPhone appeared in 2007. In fact, five years earlier, Sony released a touch-based smartphone called the Sony Ericsson P800. This ran under the Symbian OS, which was developed in the late 90s for PDAs. The final Ericsson phone was the Vivaz, which was introduced in March 2010. After that, the Ericsson brand was discontinued. We don't read imaginations for nothing more than truth. Sony dropped their previous OS and began running Android, and they abandoned the Ericsson line to focus exclusively on the Xperia. Number 4. Halo 2 Servers Few video games are as historic as Halo 2. Gentlemen, we're lucky to have you back. Its multiplayer component helped popularize Xbox Live and originated many now common aspects of online gaming, including matchmaking and lobbies. Multiplayer is a little different because it's more like a sport in that you're, you know, yes, the game is there, but it's basically helping you compete against your friends. <laughs> Yep, one could certainly make the argument that online multiplayer gaming began with Halo 2, at least within the mainstream. Oh, I haven't had a chance to shower for a few days. I've been gaming like a loon. Unfortunately, a major part of its history is now dead. The Xbox Live server was officially discontinued in April of 2010, and the PC servers were terminated three years later. I thought we were going to play Halo tonight. By the summer of 2013, all the OG Halo 2 servers were offline. Luckily, the game survives through the Master Chief collection, and its multiplayer can still be enjoyed to this day. He'll make a girl a problem if you know you can't keep it. Number 3. MSN There was simply nothing like getting home from school, grabbing a snack, and logging into MSN for the night. This was a basic service that allowed two or more people to talk to each other through text-based messaging. What about your girlfriend? Well, things are going pretty serious right now. I mean... We chat online for like two hours every day, so I guess you could say things are getting pretty serious. Voice recordings were introduced in later iterations. The service really took off in the early 2000s, with version 7.5 being released in the summer of 2005. Following that, MSN was rebranded as Windows Live Messenger, and this was officially released in June of 2006. Unfortunately, it was also around this time that social media truly blew up, leaving Messenger in the dust. I don't want things to change. But you can't stop the change. Any more than you can stop the suns from setting. Number 2. LimeWire and Napster Following the advent of the internet, it didn't take long for file sharing clients to pop up. The most popular by far were LimeWire and Napster. Well, I founded an internet company that let folks download and share music for free. Kind of like Napster? Exactly, like Napster. What do you mean? I founded Napster. Sean Parker founded Napster. Nice to meet you. These took advantage of something called peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. It essentially allowed people to download music from someone else's files without paying for it. Isn't that stealing? You downloaded a lot of songs. 
Says here you even downloaded Judas Priest? That's hard time you boys are looking at. You got anything to say for yourselves? We didn't think it was that big a deal. We'll let you be the judge. These systems exploded in the early 2000s and were easy enough to use. So much so that even the most technologically averse individuals could operate them. Of course, along with their popularity came the copyright lawsuits. As a result, Napster was forced to shut down in 2001. I'm starting to like this whole sharing thing. Hey, boys! Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Dial-up internet Anyone who used the internet in the early 2000s knows the sound of dial-up. As a result, the dial-up noise is something 14-year-old Hebe Richardson has come to dread. Dial-up allowed us to access the early internet, which was more of a Wild West experience than the corporatized internet of today. The speeds were cumbersome, and the video and audio quality was not for the faint of heart. Welcome. But there was an undeniable sense of fun to it all. Oh, hurry up, I'm a busy man. We were experiencing something truly groundbreaking, historic even. Napoleon, don't be jealous that I've been chatting online with babes all day. Of course, broadband killed dial-up in the mid-2000s, and a certain part of the internet ended with it. Broadband is the marriage of those technologies. The best description I heard came from a pioneer in broadband, Excite at Home. They call it the internet on steroids. One thing we don't miss, however, is having to log off so someone could use the phone. Yeesh. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.